I'm Joseph. And I'm Nick. And this is Fish Jelly. Yep. Yep. We're recording this on Zoom because Nick is in the state of Minnesota. I'm in the state of Minnesota. <laughs> the land of 10,000 lakes. Uh, uh, a state of repression. <laughs> So if a person is watching or listening to this on Spotify, they can watch the video as well. Um, and oh, yes. The cat is here saying hello to you. There she is. She doesn't know what's going on. Well, <laughs> she might be in the best state of all. Look, look at your dad, mama. Look. Look at her. <laughs> anyway. Put her on the spot. She can't act. She can't act. Um, how was your Thanksgiving? Good. A nice long day of food and liquor. We were, saying, we were saying yesterday that it's funny, this tradition of spending, you know, for some people, it's like a week of preparation an all day of cooking. Tony Braxton was on the Jennifer Hudson show and she said her family, they start preparing like almost two weeks before, like, cleaning the chitterlings and freezing everything and like and then it all culminates with like 30 minutes of feeding gluttony yeah yeah gluttony and then everyone passes out and then they wake up and eat more so it's actually i don't know for someone like me thanksgiving is triggering and <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah i never feel good after thanksgiving well and then you know when you're talking about family it's can be triggering a lot of other ways as well but uh yeah yeah it's it's funny all the preparation that goes into just you know we, it doesn't take long to eat and i'm oh. a family of fast eaters so yeah my <laughs> i always feel bad well since i was home alone and my mom is here we went to have like a late thanksgiving lunch at a restaurant in santa monica which was really nice it was on Ocean Drive and it faces out onto the ocean. So, and we were seated like, you know, we didn't ask to be seated in the prime spot, but the lady just put us there, I think, because it was just two of us. So we got to sit like right at, and, and look out. So that was nice. And the food was good. It was, I think, very overpriced, but also it's Thanksgiving. So I was appreciative of people willing to work that day. But um, yeah. Any uh, food me memories you want to share? Anything ultra delicious? Corn. Corn. <laughs> Nick, Nick makes a corn casserole. I wouldn't call it a casserole. Uh, I would almost I, say I would almost say it's like if like if you took cornbread and made it like a like a rich, moist. Like, like the last leche is corn cheddar corn cake. I don't know. <laughs> uh, corn delight. I corn don't know. Delight. It's something like kind of uh, retooled or something. I don't even know. I don't even know where that shit came together. But it's super simple. And every time people have it, they're like, I need the recipe. <laughs> this is so good. Yeah. And it's four yeah. ingredients. Four or five, uh, all very healthy and good for you. Uh, but well, I mean, you, it's basically sugar and cheese and corn and, <laughs> and cornbread mix and, and cornbread mix uh, and a lot of sugar. But uh, yeah, I made that uh, for my sister doesn't even like turkey for whatever reason she wanted that. So and that didn't get put in till the oven until 3 p.m. So it was a late day and uh, everything else nice and homemade and traditional kind of. But yeah, it was good. I don't normally like cranberry sauce. I would never put cranberry sauce on my plate, but of course everyone wants to give you cranberry sauce. And the mm -hmm. restaurant, I don't know if it was just because it never occurred to me, because I always think, what well, would I put the cranberry sauce on? And the plate I received, they had this homemade stuffing, which was excellent. And it was like kind of on top of the cranberry sauce. So I ate that together and I thought it was splendid. Um, splendid. Splendid. <laughs> and then for dessert, made, for dessert, sorry. oh, no, I was going to say for dessert, uh, we had the option of chocolate cake or pumpkin cheesecake. So we had one of each. And those were really good, too. I was very pleased um, with everything we had. Uh, yeah. So and we were done by three o'clock. 
Nice. Okay. Respect, a respectable hour to be done gorging. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I know I was going to, I have a friend who would always say for Thanksgiving, um, um, I'm going to lose it. I, I want to say it exactly how she always says it. Uh, like happy. No, I'm late. Oh, well, I lost it. That's lame. <laughs> so think about the like decolonization or happy <laughs> like colonizers. I don't know. But moving on. So the UK Drag Race is over. Series four. I haven't finished it. Do you want to guess who was in the top four? I thought I knew that, but... Uh, there was a top five. But, well, Black Peppa. Yeah. Uh, and who else? Cheddar Gorgeous. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Danny Beard. Oh, yeah. John Burr's Blonde. Mm -hmm. And then Pixie Polite was top five and then she got let go so the top four is just danny beard cheddar gorgeous black peppa and jumbers blonde so how do you think that went i'm guessing danny beard one that's right oh there you go well you know he was uh, yeah an, an exceptional queen uh cheddar gorgeous did really well in the yeah. final challenge and you know how sometimes Rue will say, like, if there's a top four, like, oh, I need all four of you to lip sync. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, immediately she's like, well, Jumbers and Black Peppa, you are not, uh, this is not your time. <laughs> oh, well. But... It was very obvious that Cheddar and Danny were in the top. But yeah, Danny won. So that's nice. And then the final episode, after they did their challenge, the three previous winners... Um, were there to talk to them, which I thought was nice. And then I know we don't, we're not super excited about Canada's Drag Race, but the most recent episode, episode two, had me crying because <laughs> Justin Trudeau shows up in the workroom to talk to the queens. And I thought that was really amazing because he's a world leader and he's just in this workroom saying very like, nice things and mm -hmm. yeah just being very uh yeah like accepting and i, I mean that's pretty major and then I, oh go ahead no that i agree uh <laughs> i do have to say his voice is not maybe i've never paid attention to how he speaks but he has a little bit of a speech impediment <laughs> But he's really cute. And then at the very end of his visit, because, um, you know, the queens were kind of hitting on him and he took it very well. And then at the end, Brooklyn was the one sort of uh, mediating the experience. And at the end, he goes, oh, so when am I going to meet RuPaul? <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> oh, so he's funny. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, not on this show. Okay, someone sent me information on an organization called Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. So I was reading all about it. The person who's kind of the face of it is this man named Les Knight. But he, anyway, their mission statement is, may we live long and die out. And then sort of a summary of what their ideology is phasing out the human species by voluntarily ceasing to breed will allow Earth's biosphere to return to good health. Crowded conditions and resources, uh, resource shortages will improve as we become less dense. So wow. their website, um, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, it looks like a geosite set up, like it's very old, like 1999. <laughs> but uh, there are a million links to like different information uh, which I found really interesting, um, not to be controversial, but, you know, part of why I would say I don't want kids is there are too many people in the world. So, so this kind of resonated with me, but I was thinking more like, you know, a question you can never ask people is like, why would they want to have children when the world is you know, kind of in the state it's in and we're overcrowded. Because, you know, it's not cooth to question, like, 
someone's desire to, well, especially someone's desire to give birth, because that's, I mean, what's more natural than that? But yeah, it's interesting that even with 8 billion people in the world and just like our resources dwindling, quality of life dwindling, we like it's still not appropriate to ask like why why do you think it makes sense to just keep adding more to the pile but <laughs> mm-hmm. i don't know i don't want to speculate on why but it'd be interesting to hear people talk i mean i guess no one's going to talk honestly about like i'm just selfish and <laughs> want a kid of my own i don't know <laughs> but yeah nobody wants to say that but for a lot of people that <laughs> is an underlying force but sure well because i was listening like on, i was on tiktok watching these videos of these girls like going on about how like the babies are so cute and how they want a baby and it's like well just because it's cute every time i see a dog i want one but i know that that's not appropriate for my lifestyle <laughs> like mm-hmm. yes, they're cute but anyway i feel like that's a hot button issue for sure um, well, moving on to films that were released we didn't cover. Oh, oh, that's a, that's a transition. <laughs> well, there's nothing for Sorry to This Man. Oh, I did have... Someone messaged me, and we had this long discussion about, like, loneliness. And so it was an older gay man mm-hmm. who watches our channel. And... um was like going on and on about that and then was kind of getting flirtatious and I like shot that down. And then I got this Mm -hmm. long diatribe about how no one likes him and he has spent, I I could read the messages verbatim, but I won't. Um, like, Like basically that no one likes him and that he hasn't had sex in like 13 years and that, you know, he's 60 and when he was like 20, no, yeah, maybe like in his mid to late twenties, contracted HIV and all the stuff that came along with that. But of course, now is healthy and living. But yeah, it was kind of upsetting because it, I it it took me back. It's been many many years, like over twenty years that I've been around people. Well, I mean, I knew a couple of people like that in Minnesota, but it's been a long time since I've been around someone who doesn't see how do i say this like it's not true that no one likes you it's the that you're fixated on people who are not interested in you and you're interpreting that and certainly the people who are interested in you you're rebuffing them the way people have rebuffed you and you're not putting that into the equation i don't know it was just really odd to talk to like someone older than myself and have them talk like a 16 year old Uh uh-huh yeah and yeah so i i'm stumbling because i i thought i was going to talk about it and then i didn't write it down so i'm not prepared but (laughs) it was it was pretty wild that he was being so like self-deprecating and unreasonable well and then not also realizing that you can't guilt me into sex or being sexual (laughs) and i i think that I think that maybe not, it, it's not always conscious, but yes, I've had a lot of men do that to me too, where that's almost the next ploy. And, you know, when I was young and naive, there were a lot of instances where, you know, an experience happened because of that, because I felt like I owed somebody something for liking me. And, you know, I had to learn to get over that. But <laughs> yeah. And I, but again, I resent that, I resent. Yes, of course, uh, being empathetic, but I'll, I resent the situation that that can occur because, you know, that just because somebody doesn't want to sleep with you doesn't mean uh, you're, it's a, a wasted experience. I don't know. Yeah. And I think some people put a lot of value, like their self-worth is tied into their like sexual appeal yeah it's it's validation yeah which is really unhealthy i think uh and like you said the the value of an interaction gets diminished because it doesn't end with you know this thing that someone wants from you or you want from them right it was i i can go on and on but i'm not prepared i just 
it 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 had been a very long time since someone was talking to me that way. It if like it, it took me back to when I was in college and hearing the way people would talk and sulk about not getting to interact with someone they wanted to interact with. But anyway, it, yeah. yeah. These are hard transitions. I'm still a little groggy, but okay. So we can go on to films released we didn't cover. Fantasy football. Oh, you know, I, I, had, I had desires to write about a couple things I watched, but I didn't. But one of them was fantasy football with Omari Hardwick and uh, Kelly Rowland, <laughs> directed by Anton Anton Cropper, uh, which I watched. I, I think I was still at home when I saw that. But uh, did you like it? It was okay. It's using a very familiar formula and not, uh, you know, Kelly Rowland. Was she, better, was she better than in The Curse of Bridge Hollow? Yes, but she's also supposed to be, she just can't be a mom. She just doesn't give mom vibes on screen. Like, I don't. Well, to be clear, she is a mom, but I, I, but I agree with what you're saying. I, I think she comes across a little too, uh, yeah, we have to be careful because it, it, like it's not that she's so pretty and put together she can't be a mom but yeah there's something cuz i've cuz we watched another movie with her where she was supposed to be someone's mom and it just felt like you are not giving i don't think it's that she's not a nurturer or caretaker i just don't think she has strong acting ability <laughs> yeah she just she seems kind of detached uh, in that yeah. regard but yeah. uh yeah you know i like omari hardwick he he plays this football player that's kind of reached his sell by date almost in there's a, a, a scene where uh, a Madden game is struck by lightning that both him and his daughter are arguing over. And uh, then the daughter discovers that she has the ability to uh, have powers over her father through the game while they play. So it's very uh, familiar and at the same time far-fetched and doesn't bother to explain itself all that well, but it, it's I'm okay. Assuming, like, I'm assuming there are sweet moments. There are sweet moments, but they're they also feel a little bit phoned in because of the familiarity of this device that's obviously unexplainable used to uh, for this family to learn very basic uh, lessons about I'm I'm a young girl discovering who I am and you're a father who needs to move on from himself and uh, again Kelly Rowland had nothing to do but <laughs> if you like any of those people of course it's worth a watch. Speaking of Omari Hardwick, stop. Uh, I'm going to dole out advice. Stop telling people who they look like because it's been like it, it, it's never good in either direction. Because if you tell me I look like someone who I don't think is very good looking, that's insulting. And then if you tell me I look like someone much more attractive, like an Omari Hardwick, then it's like, what am I supposed to say? I do not look like Omari Hardwick. We're both brown and I have like, we have similarities, but I do not look like that man. So, yeah, I, I feel so uncomfortable when people say shit like that because it's like, on what planet do I look like Omari Hardwick? So it's like, because there's a lot loaded into that. Like, you have this fantasy of this person, and because I'm kind of adjacent to that, like, I, it, it doesn't feel good to be told that I look like a better-looking version of, of like... <laughs> Because <laughs> you're just putting something on me that doesn't. Sure, but understanding that that is not the intention. I'm, I'm sure. No, no, Thank but you. that's why I'm saying I think people need to think about. I know I compare people all the time, but I feel like that's my job. But <laughs> and I don't know these people. <laughs> but yeah, to tell someone directly like who they look like is like it's not going to. It probably won't be well, well received. I might smile and be like, okay. <laughs> But I'm gonna have an attitude. Okay, next is something yeah. called next go, go. is something called devotion. Yeah, you refused. You did straight up refuse to go to the press screening uh, of this with uh, it's directed well, by. Why Jake. are you trying to control me? <laughs> I'm not. Uh, speaking of jobs and expectations, uh, it's not about control. I can't watch. I can't watch everything. I have to choose, and this shit did not look good to me at all. <laughs> And you, okay, sure. Uh, directed by J.D. Dillard. Uh, I think I saw his last film, Sweetheart. Uh, starring Jonathan Majors and Glenn Powell as uh, U.S. Navy fighter pilots uh, during the Korean War. All right. Uh, Strange World. 
Strange World. I'm trying to think now. What was that? Uh, oh, it's a co-directed by Don Hall and uh, Ki Nguyen. And uh, it's an animated film. And Gabrielle Union, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Jabuki Young White have voices. But I actually don't even know what that's about. But that came out. Lady Chatterley's Lover. Lady Chatterley's Lover. Uh, which is a very scandalous D.H. Lawrence novel, of course. And periodically gets remade. And here we have another remake uh, that premiered on Netflix, uh, I think right before Thanksgiving, directed by Laura de Clermont-Tonnerre, whose last film was The Mustang, uh, starring, I think, Matthias Schoenartz, which had some nice moments, but I thought was kind of a so-so film. Uh, I liked this latest. I like Jack O'Connell uh, as the lover. And uh, there are some enjoyable moments, but uh, and it, it is very sexual. It's a very sexual novel uh, to the degree where I was shocked to see, what was that Stephen King out of Mr. Harrigan's phone with Donald Sutherland, where he has this child reading it, that book out loud to him. It's like, oh no, that's... Uh, yeah, Jaden Martell's character is supposed to be like... Like I mean, 13, reading, reading this. Younger than that, right? Because he's in high school. Yeah, he's like an adolescent or a like, Thir like 13 reading this book to this old man <laughs> uh yes and that's it i still remember because i read i read that book secretly uh and i was probably in like sixth or seventh grade and it's very sexual but anyway there are frequently adaptations of it this was a a decent one it reminded me of several previous ones that i haven't watched uh but it, it, it's worth a look and there's male frontal nudity you do see jack o'connell naked yeah uh, the Swimmers. The Swimmers, uh, Sally El Hosseini. I think I reviewed her previous film, My Brother the Devil, which I remember kind of liking. Uh, and this is about... It'll be a chapter in my sister's book. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is about two Syrian sisters, I believe, uh, but I did not watch it. The Corridors of Power. That's a new... Story of my butt. No, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You'd like That's to, actually really uh, fast. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> that wouldn't be my book title, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, it's a, I'd say it's a place I'm locked out of. Uh, Dror Mora, <laughs> the documentarian, who I've seen his previous one of his previous works, The Gatekeepers, which is pretty interesting. Uh, this is a new documentary about how kind of how the U.S. knew about the, all the shit going on in the Soviet Union and kind of just ignored it, but. Yeah, that came out. Freedom on Fire, Ukraine's Fight for Freedom. That's a terrible title. <laughs> yes, and it's actually a follow-up to a previous documentary, I'm forgetting the title of, uh, on Ukraine from Evgeny Afanivsky. But of course, this one, his previous documentary is uh, from 2015. So of course, this one is incorporating uh, the war on Ukraine that's still underway. Leonor Will Never Die. This sounded really interesting. Uh First time director from the Philippines, Martika Ramirez Escobar. I think it played out at Sundance. And I think it's about a woman that hits her head and then becomes a star in her own movie inside her head. Uh, it, it looked fascinating. We have a screener for it. I still kind of want to watch that, but that came out. Lastly, White Noise. Uh, Noah Baumbach, who opened Venice this year with this film with the Don DeLillo adaptation of a very notable novel, uh, which I thought the adaptation had some ups and downs. I liked Adam Driver, thought Greta Gerwig was a little uh, miscast, but uh, it had some interesting things about it. I think Netflix is releasing it theatrically first before it's streaming, but it's a Netflix production. Okay, movies we watched for fun. Um, you know, I've mentioned that I like the podcast Bad Gay Movies, mm -hmm. and I'll often watch so it's uh they review uh, bad movies with gay themes and i will often like seek out the film to watch and every time i do i'm like god this is bad which i think is funny because like someone just spent 40 minutes telling me it's bad and then i watch it like oh this is terrible but i watched a movie called um out of body and that was a uh, bad gay movies most recent episode and it's written directed and uh, by this guy named Jason Gaffney, who's also the star. 
Yeah, and it was fascinating how poorly done this movie was and how ridiculous the story was. But it did make me think that making, you know, like self-producing a little indie film is very doable. Mm-hmm. And I actually liked, it's not even worth going, <laughs> this movie, it is available on Amazon Prime. Uh, and the star plays this guy who's in love with his best friend. But like there's like a Halloween party and someone brings like this possessed globe that conjures this demon that takes over the body of the best friend. So now the spirit of the best friend is left like bound to this house with the star. So it's all shot in one location, like in this house. And then it's about them discovering they love each other. And ultimately they lure the demon back to like switch bodies. Uh, it's but it's terribly done. It's supposed to be a comedy, mm-hmm. but it's not funny. Right away, even you describing that to me again, I my mind goes to the ghost and Mrs. Muir with uh, Rex Harrison. <laughs> and... <laughs> so that movie was done in 2020. So I watched that movie and then I saw that he has another film, his first film that he did in 2012 called The Perfect Wedding, which is also available on Amazon Prime. And that movie from eight years prior somehow uh, I think made more sense. It's still terrible, but yeah, I mean, good for this guy. He's also hearing impaired. So, you know, there's some representation there in his first film about showing that he is like he speaks ASL. He can also Mm -hmm. um, speak, but um, yeah, those two things were horrible, but shout out to uh, someone making their own movie. Anyway, you watched something called Marty. Something called Marty. Uh, Yeah, the best picture winner from 1955, starring Ernest Borgnine, who won his Oscar. Uh, I I saw it once before in San Francisco, and I probably sent this list to you out of order, because another film I watched with my family spurred them to watch Marty over the past couple of days, because my dad and sister had never seen it. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's such a, a sweet, very touching film. It's about this, uh, Italian man, this butcher played by Borgnine who lives with his mother. Uh, he's never really had a relationship, but the community, like 1950s Italian American community is very judgmental about kind of making him feel like a big, ugly, fat loser. Uh, and he, just happens to find this meek kind of mousy woman played by Betsy Blair, who I didn't realize was married to Gene Kelly. That was her first husband, uh, who's also treated like she's a dog, basically. That's the terminology used in the film. There's one line where he's like, you're not so much of a dog as you think you are. But this is this very touching mo- like moment of these two people coming together and finding a genuine connection, even though both of them are kind of allowed to be treated in their own separate communities as if they're nothing. Uh, Yeah, and it's one of only three films that won both Best Picture in the US and the top prize at Cannes. Mm. But yeah, highly recommended if if you've never seen Marty. You put on Alien Resurrection last week. Why did we watch that movie? It was my birthday and uh, I was, I had updated, I completed my letterbox and it dawned on me that I haven't, sat down and watched Alien Resurrection from start to finish in like 14 years. So it felt like time. I So that means I haven't watched it. You probably did without me. I don't think I've seen that movie then. Oh, well. If I I, didn't watch it, if I didn't watch it with you, I definitely didn't watch it beforehand. So then I saw Alien Resurrection for the first time last week. And I I don't know. Your your memory is terrible. Uh, I feel like you probably ran through the Alien series when you were dating me to impress me. I feel like you watched that movie. I recognize the basketball scene. Uh, Because I remember that from like when the movie came out, I recall that image. And then you had a you had like premiere magazine cover with Sigourney Weaver and Winona Ryder, a a French premiere cover that's one of my favorite Sigourney covers because it's it's the two of them and Sigourney has this long hair and looks fantastic. But but I did like it. I think it looks really good. I like the vibe of it. I think the story and how they bring back. Sigourney's character who died in Aliens, the second movie. Alien 3. Or Alien 3, sorry. Um, I, I think was clever. 
yes, there are very interesting elements, but it, it's a bit, it, it's missing some key components, I think, and that as a 13 year old, I would have refused to admit, but watch rewatching it, it, it does have some, it does have some narrative issues for sure. And there are some, I don't think Winona Ryder is very good in it, uh, but. Uh, I, if I had to give it a score, I'd probably give it like three and a half. Oh, damn. That's higher than I gave it. Uh, I, I really like Sigourney in it. I think she's quite fascinating as this hybrid human. Uh, the worst the finale. It, yeah, the finale with the like the hybrid alien looked. Those practical effects are terrible, considering the movie looks so good and the actual alien queen looks so good. I was kind of astonished at how bad the hybrid looks. And I also, um, I think, what is his name who plays Hellboy? Uh, Ron Perlman. I really didn't like Ron Perlman in that movie. I feel like he brought it down a notch. I mean, I like Ron Perlman, but that character being so like over the top. He's I, over the top. I think that, that, and that leads into Joss Whedon's screenplay, I think is very much trying to have this uh, kind of funny biting vibe and almost every use of comedy in alien resurrection is not good it's unsuccessful but i yeah and especially it it I, I feel like it's unnecessary because the vibe is so effective and i think sigourney's character could have been written to be a little more sinister because mm -hmm. she seems a little like like she's in on a joke and yeah. it's kind of and it's fun to watch because she looks great that being said, though, for something I wasn't planning on watching, like you just put it on, it did keep my attention. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I, I think I would still give it three and a half. No, and I think her, she looked fantastic. Uh, so it's always, I, I, you know, I love watching a lot of her films from the 90s, I think, because I, I just really loved her. Look. I still do love her look. The but... underwater scene where the alien oh. is swimming, I thought that was really good. Yeah, and of course, that's a reference to the Poseidon Adventure, where they have to swim underwater through the boat that has turned upside down. Well, let's keep it moving. Uh, you watch Disclosure? You watch Disclosure with me. What is let's, that? Let's reboot your memory. Michael Douglas, Demi Moore. All about sexual harassment. There you go. <laughs> oh. We're all on the same page now. Uh, yes, directed by Barry Levinson, which was, of course, a huge deal in 1994. Michael Crichton wrote the book and sold the movie rights for like a million dollars before the book was even published. Uh, <laughs> this movie, oh my God, I'd never seen it before, but woo! It is very, like, heavy-handed. We are going to, we, we, we have a message we want to relay. It is basically about reverse- well, I mean, reverse, like this man being sexually harassed by his female boss. The problem, the there are a lot of problems with this movie. Yeah. I think the biggest problem is there. Uh, the writing is not great to me because I really didn't like that Michael Douglas's character. It the writing is not finessed enough to show how Michael Douglas is also behaving inappropriately in the workplace. So when yes. he gets harassed, that becomes a point in like the mediation that like, well, you also were talking about stuff and you didn't seem to have a problem then. It just feels very like obtuse and well, it, there's no it's there's really no, spelling things out for us during the like the mediation. There's no subtlety and there's no subtext. It's it's like white male fears of the 1990s. Yes. Uh, uh, th but but that are it's like a perfect scenario because he had a previous relationship with the Demi Moore character, which also kind of sanitizes his behavior because part of the contention is that he's interact. She is coming on to him and he is saying no, but he's also aroused, you know, right. that and then Michael Douglas's uh, mm -hmm. his character's wife. I, I thought her, like that character was written poorly, like how she's so upset about <laughs> like, she, because again, they're trying to just reverse everything. So the wife is yelling at him, like how, like you let this happen. And, but, and he's trying to say like, no, she came on to me. Uh, it's so, yeah, it's, it's on the level of like an after school special. Uh, but it is kind of fun to watch Demi Moore and Michael Douglas just 
stomp around, I guess. <laughs> Um, and by far the most uh, cringing moment has nothing to do with that. It has him because he is uh, developing this because they didn't try to fire him for incompetence. Oh. He's developing this virtual reality software and he has to go into the virtual reality and sneak into this hotel room. And she's in another uh, secret location and she's also in it. And they uh, visualize that by her having this kind of digitized body that okay the only reason like i would recommend this movie just for that scene which is like sort of the climax at the end because there's like a countdown to when michael douglas's character can retrieve some files and demi Moore's, files yeah and demi moore's character is deleting these files as he's looking for them in this vr environment and then we get their avatars in the vr environment like crossing paths that shit looks so and crunchy her, her coding and um deleting the files like oh my god it. and then how she's coding is like do it do it all do it right now like i don't think that's... forward slash kill kill malaysia yeah i i'm 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 not a, a tech person but that doesn't seem right <laughs> Like, okay, you watch Julie and Julie. Once. I'll uh, say it again. Uh, nothing. What's oh. up? The, the, you watch Julie and Julia. I did on the plane over here, uh, flight. I had never seen this film and have to say that it might not have been as bad as I was expecting, but it also isn't good. And another, I think, undeserved Meryl Streep nomination for playing Julia Child. No. Uh, and Amy Adams doing her best with a role that you know because you know what it's about it's about this woman in 2002 who picks up uh, julia child's cookbook which uh, showed america how to cook uh, french cuisine and in one year's time cooked every single recipe in that book and blogged about it and mm. became a sensation and it's a nora efron film and i, I do like nora efron for the most part and uh I don't know. It it has some nice moments, but it it also was it was it was hokey. Compulsion. Comp oh, uh, I also watched this with my parents, directed by Richard Fleischer. Uh, basically, a story about Leopold and Loeb uh, with Dean Stockwell and Bradford Dillman and Orson Welles, all three of whom won, I, I believe, shared a best actor best acting award at Cannes at that film festival uh it, it's about Leopold Loeb it said 1924 Chicago uh two men who consider themselves to be brilliant uh who murder uh, in reality a 14 year old boy but then get hemmed up because it turns out they weren't so brilliant uh and Hitchcock of course made a film about this uh that is better rope uh but with Jimmy Stewart and Farley Granger uh, but there are things I liked about it. But uh, Dean Stockwell looked very, he was reminding me of uh, young James Franco in this. Uh, and it's, it was, Orson Welles looked terrible. And again, again, they have makeup, they have makeup on him to make him look older. But it, he still was only, I think, 44 when he made this. And it's like, whoa, you lived another 80, 40 years. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it's worth a look. I, I did enjoy it. I think somebody brought that up in a chat once uh, with us too about if we'd seen that film, but yeah. Bad Day at Black Rock. This is the reason we watched Marty because uh, we were tired and the runtime was 80 minutes and uh, it's directed by John Sturgis. Spencer Tracy won Best Actor at Cannes and was nominated for uh, Academy Award for this film, one of nine or whatever. Uh, and he was, Ernest Borgnine who co-started with him would win for Marty that same year. But this movie was dull. It's so dull in a plot that's used so many, it, it recycled in so many ways in different films, but this man that shows up in this small town, which is like four houses, uh, that has a secret. And basically it's, they killed the Japanese American that had uh, a piece of land with gold on it and tried to make it look like he'd been taken away at an internment camp uh, circa Pearl Harbor. Uh, but it, it was uh, it was very dull. Uh, but a young Borgnine Lee Marvin, uh, yeah. Uh, Mis Mysterious Island of Beautiful Women. Oh, this was a terrible film that really deserves a mystery science theater treatment. But oh. it was the last, it's a TV film from 1979 uh, and it's directed by Joseph Pevney. 
who I do enjoy his film, uh, Female on the Beach, starring Joan Crawford. But uh, it's not, uh, a, it, it's, it's basically kind of like a plot like Yellow Jackets, where uh, <laughs> these young girls that are taken out of a, like a Catholic school in French Indochina in 1954 because they're being shot at, uh, get away by the skin of their teeth on a plane, uh, but th which crashes and the one nun that's with them dies. And then uh, 20 years later, uh, some men show up in this island and discover these women. There's, uh, oh God, what's his name? They see these women and he's like, that's a white woman. <laughs> uh but also there's there's one black woman Rosalind Chow has a part but there's one black woman played by Jane Kennedy and her character name she might be better known for a film she did shortly after that called Body and Soul but her character's name is Chocolate oh it's so stupid it's it's clearly written by men and they're like what would these what would these stupid women be like that are trapped in this island that grow up into these like sexy nymphettes because all these girls seem brain dead and they even though ostensibly they would have known english and been old enough to know english they they can't speak it correctly it's so stupid it was so dumb oh my god well lastly i watched freddie versus jason speaking of kelly Rowland, <laughs> i think that was her first acting role where she uses the f slur uh oh, yeah. was, it, it, it has its moments but boy oh boy <laughs> that's i watched that once and it was hard to get through and i don't have a desire to watch it again i actually think uh kind of the bones of the story of how like i mean how the two come together is ridiculous but also fun but i think like how freddie has to be brought back by getting people to remember him you know works well i think the freddie part works much better than the jason part because then we oh. just get a scene of the mom like telling him like you'll never die wake up and okay <laughs> sounds like a social media allegory yeah but i would definitely be into i i can see what like the nightmare on elm street and friday the 13th movies being redone and reborn i'm i'm into it i would be into another nightmare on elm street <laughs> because um like Freddy Krueger is vile. I I think I forgot because we watched all of them like what four years ago for Halloween. Yeah, back to back, which is a mistake though because they all kind of blend together like runny eggs. But yeah, it it it, 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 it was a mistake. But in Freddy versus Jason, we get a little montage of how Freddy Krueger came to be, and it's pretty wild to think like thirty years ago watching these movies. Well, he's a pedophile, wasn't he? yeah but like was like mutilating and torturing these kids and like <laughs> and i was just a kid watching these movies like yeah <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. okay like that uh, happens <laughs> yeah projects of interest the pocket watch uh brandy is going to be cinderella again in the pocket watch directed by jennifer fang so that could be interesting yeah i like her i watched <laughs> I watched a little like documentary about her daughter who's now a singer. And I have to say, um, I was, the daughter definitely seems like the kind of kid who grew up with like a famous parent and all the things. And her, and her personality was not cute, but. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, and then you, uh, oh, Blade, the remake of Blade. I, we might have talked about the, this already. We've talked about this before, yeah. Yeah, because Mahershala Ali is going to be Blade. But the, a director has signed on, and it's uh, Jan Demange, whose film 71 I quite like with Jack O'Connell. Uh, and also, I think you were in the room and I watched White Boy Rick. Um, but yeah, he's he's signed on. So that's, that's interesting. I'm curious to see, speaking of remaking and rebooting things, I'm curious to see what they'll do with that. But well, unfortunately, there are entries in the obituary section. Jason David Frank. Well, one of the Power Rangers, the original Power Rangers, he died. Yeah. And then Irene Cara died. What? I didn't see that. Yeah. She was uh, 63. She was so, only 63? Yeah. No. Yeah. So in Sparkle, how old was she? The original or the remake? The original. The original. She's she's the original Sparkle. Um, God, I didn't know she died. Wait, Irene Kara's the original Sparkle? 
Yeah. She is. That movie is 1976, so that was 46 years ago. So she would have been 17. Oh, Irene Cara, um, that album with uh, her her best known song on it. I, I happened to randomly listen to that after we watched, I think, DC Cab starring, uh, oh God, uh, Mr. T. Uh, I think a Joel Schumacher film because they used that song, The Dream. Well, uh, well, to be clear, Irene Cara is a Grammy and Academy Award winning singer. She wrote the song, What a Feeling for Flashdance. Yeah. And then she did the theme song for the movie Fame. Mm -hmm. And so but, she, those are her two biggest songs. Sure. But the, the Dream was on DC Cab and I was like, oh, I'd never heard that song before. And I'm like, let me listen. I'd never listened to that album because uh, I think I was... Uh, I had on repeat for a couple months, Romance 83. And I know I made you listen to that song, which I quite like. Uh, and, you know, she also did the voice of Snow White in a cartoon that I would watch as a kid where Ed Asner is also in it. Uh, yeah, I have fond memories of her. I, that's too bad. She wasn't, she wasn't that old. Well, in college, um, Global DJs has a remix of What a Feeling that I would play on repeat. <laughs> like on repeat and then of course um the movie fame was 1980 i've never seen it but the tv show fame was from like 1982 to 87 so you know, i remember okay. it huh and you know who was on that show and then you know uh international pop icon uh janet jackson is in season four and she talks about how much she hated filming that show but partially because she was in a really shitty relationship with James DeBar or L DeBarge, but um, the uh, the song that's used in the TV show is a different singer, like retooling it. So it's not Irene Cara's version, but it made me think I should probably watch Fame, the movie. Yeah, I've actually uh, never seen that either. But yeah. um, in Flashdance, so, I think Flashdance is actually a really fun movie. Directed by Adrian Flashdance. Lyon. You know, my very first time, my very first memory of going to a, a like a movie was a drive in movie, like in the car. And I was probably like, what year was Flashdance? I think 83. So I was five. That sounds, it's, yeah, it was about that time. Yeah. You know, we were in the car and we watched Flashdance, and all of a sudden there are, you know, like breasts on the screen. And I remember my mom screaming, like, close your eyes, don't look at me. <laughs> don't worry <laughs> yeah okay well the secret film today was nick's selection you selected the 1972 swedish period drama written and directed by ingmar bergman called cries and whispers why yes. did you choose this movie i've been were wanting you, were you trying to tell me something <laughs> no it's it's my favorite ingmar bergman film uh and i it's I think somebody had asked us long ago, somebody had asked me long ago, like, oh, you should show this to Joseph and see what he thinks. Uh, but it, yeah. Oh, because, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought you're going to say I remind you of like things in this movie. <laughs> no, I was not thinking, because we watched this separately. I watched it with my family who, I don't know that they loved it, but. Uh... Yeah, this is not a movie that, well, you're very good at like making people uncomfortable with your movie selections. But yeah, I was thinking this is not a movie to show like, like your family on Thanksgiving, but okay. In in my world, yes. Uh, but in your world, Nick, yeah, Nick's really good at uh, changing the air in the room. But <laughs> oh boy. So. So I, I, you know, it's only an hour and a half. It, uh, notably, it I think it played out a competition at Cannes that year, but uh, it received distribution in the U.S. courtesy of Roger Corman of all people. <clears throat> excuse me and received uh, you know several oscar nominations but uh quite notably was nominated for best picture which was really rare it's still really it's still very rare for a film a foreign language an international feature to uh, receive a best picture nomination at the academy awards but uh well let me read the synopsis of the movie when a woman dying of cancer in early 20th century Sweden is visited by her two sisters, long repressed feelings between the siblings rise to the surface. So the basic story is there's a lady named Agnes 
Yeah, played she by has Harry. Uterine, she has uterine cancer. Played by Harry she, Anderson. Mm -hmm. And she's laid up in this mansion in Sweden somewhere with her maid named Anna. Mm -hmm. Played by and, Kate Solon. Mm -hmm. And her two sisters, uh, Maria and Corinne. Mm -hmm. Liv, Al Liv Allman and Ingrid Tulin. They show up to be with her. And it is very clear that, like, they are not particularly close, like, physically or emotionally. And Agnes dies. So now the maid is left there with the two sisters. There's a funeral. The husbands of the sisters show up. They have to decide what to do with Anna. So they basically kick her ass to the curb. The end. But I think <clears throat> it's a very well done movie and the story is very interesting. It's not an injury, like it's kind of a miserable story and a miserable, you know, film, but it's very well done. I would say probably the biggest thing I took away from it is how it looks. Oh, it's, it's Sven Nickvist who shot many Bergman productions. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. The, yeah, they, I mean, I don't know if they found this mansion and they just lucked out that it has like these red rooms and red carpets or if they actually did some set design, but like the, the, the mansion looks really cool and is shot really well. The way the sisters look, like their hair and how uptight they seem. And then there are a lot of close-ups mm -hmm. that I think are really well done. And whoever did these ladies' makeup, they look like Karen, the mean sister, I thought she looked fantastic. Well, Ingrid Tulin, who's usually a blonde, beautiful woman. Even my mother commented like, oh, that woman has a beautiful face. She's very striking. And you know what? Uh, you've seen Ingrid before uh, in Return from the Ashes. And you commented on how interesting she was to watch in that film. And I know you yeah. have no idea of it, but yeah. Yeah, you know, usually I find close-ups to be distracting, but in this film, I thought they were very well done. There are also some really great transitions with the use of the color red mm -hmm. that worked really well. And then the story is very, I mean, it's very relatable. It's just miserable, but it's... Relatable, but there's also lots of abstract uh, themes going on about uh, religion. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go through my notes because we kind of have to wrap it up, but there so the film is kind of the i don't generally love the use of like flashbacks like i'm very easily confused but i thought this film does it really well how like something will happen and someone will like like for instance maria the sort of like prettier more flirtatious sister she agnes's doctor shows up and then she's being flirtatious with him and she's making out with him. And then we get a flashback to kind of like where their relationship kind of started and how she had an affair with this doctor, which we can get into. But um, yeah, I thought the use of flashbacks was very effective in this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that doctor played by Erland Josephson, who notably played a different uh, coupling with Liv Ullman in Bergman's Scenes from a Marriage. But mm -hmm uh agnes is keeping a journal and i thought it was funny because you know she's on her deathbed writing about how she doesn't feel well and i thought what would my journal look like if i had to write down how i felt every day <laughs> oh poor harriet anderson who's fantastic in an earlier bergman film through glass darkly as well uh but you know it 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 has a very cold slow lead in until i think the point where she's kind of howling in pain uh and then it kind of spirals into all if you like like movies with bitchy prickly beautiful women screaming at one another you know this is a film that should be in your wheelhouse to see, to see. well it's very light on the it's not hysterical by any no, means no. but it is i mean there's one scene where in, in particular where it's kind of like, oh, gosh, but like, it's hard to hear you talk to your sister that way. Um, but so Maria, the more flirtatious sister, when Agnes's doctor shows up, Maria's all about him. And then she's like trying to get on him. And then we get a flashback and we realize that Maria had had an affair with the doctor and her husband found out and couldn't deal with it. So he goes and like, commit seppuku <laughs> but he lives clearly he lives but 
it, it, it's a good scene because he won't she won't help him like he's like please help me and she looks at him like boy bye <laughs> i thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. um okay the maid anna mm -hmm. she is the only person in the house who seems to have any like sort of care um and she's very like touchy feely which is a plot point because both maria and karen are talking about how they just didn't grow up like that like they don't like being touched and why don't we ever touch why aren't we more intimate and then you have the maid running around um trying to do that specifically when agnes is in bed like in agony and she's in pain <laughs> anna pulls out her big old titty and like like sucres her which you know i'm sure there's a history of that that in certain cultures is considered like like normal but it was very interesting to watch and it made me think of the movie dirty love with jenny mccarthy oh god when her one of her breasts are hanging out and carmen electra was like girl you got your big old titty hanging out uh -huh. <laughs> but uh -huh. i thought that was very interesting because i got like I don't know. I mean, I, it's it's hard not to get like lesbianic vibes from it. Yeah, but maybe like, that was about intimacy, about intimacy between women and you know familial bonds and how she's kind of taken. Anna kind of has to assume this motherly, even sisterly figure that the other two can't fulfill yeah. for her. Uh, that I think doesn't even I, again I, where the film at the moment where the film ends. It's a flashback scene. I think that's where a lot of the power really resonates uh from everything else it's it's to me it's like a film that's a little bit like a bruise where at, after the impact you see the damage uh is is how the end of this film feels to me but uh yeah that it's hard not to feel the lesbianic vibes uh, also between the moment where maria Liv Ullman is trying to because they're also representative of different things because their sister who's we're told by that priest is like even more spiritual than I am and kind of comes back like Jesus <laughs> for a, a one sequence, you know, Liv Ullman is overly flirtatious, but there's an emptiness in it. And then Ingrid Tulin is, you know, sexually, um, emotionally, intimately repressed. Uh, and when they're trying to come together, it almost seems like they're trying to make out. <laughs> My dad's like, God, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, it was uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> My next note is Anna uh, Agnes, the dying sister, she needed to go on ahead and die because <laughs> we get like three scenes of her in bed, just like, I'm in pain, someone help me. Like, and then her breathing is really labored. Child, just die. Um, okay, so Karen, her husband is vile. Like, he's just gross and mean, and they're having dinner, and it's, I forget how she words it, but she I kind of asked him, like, what is the plan for tonight? Like, she's trying to ask her. No, he, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no. I think he asked her. Oh, right. They're, the, the, the two of them are having dinner, and Karen's the bitchy sister. And it becomes clear to her that he's thinking, like, he wants to be intimate with her that evening. And you can just see in her face, she's like, I would rather die than touch this man. And this lady she happens to break a wine glass and she keeps a piece of the broken wine glass. And after she gets into her dressing gown, this lady takes that broken glass and mutilates her genitals. Cuts her vulva, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very Lars von Trier. Mm -hmm. And then gets into bed with her husband who's like across the room looking at her like he's ready to get some. And then we see her open her legs and she's just a bloody mess and she smears it on her face like you want it now. I thought that was such a good scene. Um, it's really hard to watch, but yeah, yeah. There, there is so. I mean, I could talk about that for an hour. Uh, but yeah, that was really good. Um, I agree. Uh, then Karen and Maria, the two sisters who are the two surviving sisters, are having a talk, and Maria is telling her sister, "Why can't we be close? Why can't we like? Why can't we move forward and be more?" like intimate with each other and at first Karen seems like maybe she thinks that's like a nice idea and maybe she wants to do that and then she just like flips and basically tells her sister like do you know how much I hate you <laughs> like I hate everything about this I hate being touched I don't want anyone to talk to me about shit 
And I just, that really resonated with me too. Like, <laughs> but it's so miserable. Mm -hmm. It is it so sumptuous. And the, you, the use of color is very important because uh, yeah. the, the, the crimson room, which reminds me of a scene in Jane Eyre as well. But it, like even the blankets on the dying sister, every time she puts that red blanket. And I think the segues using the color, using crimson also suggests like kind of death, because uh, we're always looking backwards in those transitions and uh, she's slowly being consumed by this red blanket, et cetera. Uh, and then the flashback scene, which is out of uh, Agnes's diary, uh, like at a happier time with the sisters and Anna were together and they're all in, you know, very glaring white and they run and go swing on that swing. Uh, I, I, I like the use of that would uh, actually be a beautiful poster to have is the, the 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 image of the four ladies in white outside and it's like and I think I was reading that's a reference to like a popular painting or something but oh I believe it yeah or 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 maybe that was like on like a Swedish postage stamp or something like that but yeah I, I thought that imagery was beautiful that towards the end of the film, there's like a dream sequence where Agnes comes back from the dead and she's like trying Jesus. to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and everyone's like, but freaked out, except of course, Anna, who's there to like, you know, caress her. But yeah, yeah. She, she calls her sisters in one by one. Uh, and basically Karen's like, you know, maybe this would matter if I loved you, but I don't. <laughs> Yeah. And in the end, um, after the funeral, after they've decided they're going to sell the house and get rid of everything, initially, Maria is like, well, we should give Anna something. She spent like 12 years taking care of our sister. We should give her a little severance pay and let her take a memento. But then the vile husband of Karen says no. Like, she's young. She can find work. We're not responsible for taking care of her in the future. He's so like, she had 12 easy years. Like yeah. And she, uh, and then they offer her a memento and she says no. And then the husband's like, oh, look at her trying to be noble. Like, ugh. But um, yeah, this movie overall made me feel, I mean, it. I, I think the feeling it invokes is really about how we feel about intimacy and um, getting our needs met in many different ways. And I, it, what really resonated with me is I often feel like so much of like intimacy involves other people's needs. And I think it's such a weird thing to be so involved in someone else's like intimate needs, because then it's, it's like, well, what about my own needs? And I think I related to Karen just because it feels like that lady, like she has a lot, she's dealing with and needs to process. And in the midst of that is being pulled in these directions. The, I mean, I think many of us could relate to that and, and, it, it's not an easy watch it, it, it's not a pleasurable movie it is very well done and i think it's pretty provocative um, well you know the, the forced intimacy of family and in, in these i wouldn't movies. watch it with family um <laughs> i did i wouldn't watch it with like a significant other probably but i think it's uh yeah it was good i would give it like four out of five Oh, yeah, Ber I mean, you know, not everything by Bergman is perfect, of course, but, you know, consistently, he's just a phenomenal director, even though, you know, arguably, he was also kind of a terrible human. But uh, I don't know, Liv Ullman, Ingrid Tulin, Harriet Anderson, the three of them. Yeah, I don't know. There, there's just the, there's a level of perfection to me in this film uh, that sure, it's not a pleasurable experience, but it's cinematically pleasurable for certain sure all right well <clears throat> what do you have going on this week uh so many things more interviews of uh for international film features uh we have violent night off the top of my head i know is is coming out this week i think we see that monday um, uh, of course i want to watch that movie i don't know anything about it but it's a studio picture right yes yes it is oh. There's something called number, <clears throat> excuse me, number 10. I'm forgetting who directed that, but that sounds interesting. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, of course, excited to see Avatar, The Wave Water, uh, but that's, I think we're still two weeks out from a screening of that. But yeah, that's about it. All right. Well, if you don't have anything else to say, we will uh, end this. Adjourn. The, we will end our journey. <laughs> Is that what you said? 
Oh, I said adjourn. Oh, the, the meeting is adjourned. Mm-hmm. All right, well, ta-ta for now. Oh, my God.